All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and I'll get started. There's been people coming in as we've been talking about uh, Tony Moorhead and her upcoming talk here on her page of fall winter gardening tips and to do's for North Central Texas. So later today, after this talk, you know exactly what you're supposed to go do in the garden. So you can just head on out. And uh, Tony is coming to us from Tanner County Master Gardeners. She's been uh, association. She's been a master gardener there since 2005. Mm -hmm. And if you look at her initials after her name over there on, on the title page, you see MG for Master Gardener and TCLP for um, certif your certified uh, Texas landscape professional. So uh, Tony has, uh, uh, she's a di designer for a business, her, her own business, Signature Gardens, and Sig Signature Gardens is also online where you produce a newsletter mm -hmm. with some of the information you're going to share with us today. So throughout the year, you can go visit her blog and learn more about gardening in North Texas. Tony's also been a member of the Grapevine Garden Club since 2002. And you moved, you lived in Texas. So you moved to Texas in 1986. Yes. And uh, you've been in Grapevine since 88. And you grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. So you've been in yeah. digging in the dirt for a long time. But a lot yeah. of lot yeah. different yeah. type of gardening between here and there. Yeah. And you were talking earlier about uh, Salvia Lucantha and your church, but there is a, a large church that you take care of the landscape of in uh, Countryside Bible Church in South Lake, and you post pictures of its landscape, and it's an unusual landscape in that it's very sloped, but it, it's very beautiful, and you've planted it with a lot of natives. Um, your garden's been featured, as you said earlier, you like to open your garden, you're very gracious, and you've been featured on several garden tours, and um, our own master gardeners from Denton County have been invited over and we appreciate that. At the end of Tony's talk, we're giving away some top 100 cards with the information. Oh, you got some too. <laughs> it's a, uh, so stay around for that. If you have questions, we'll take those at the end of the talk. And this is being sponsored by Denton County Master Gardener Association. Each year we host Fall Garden Fest as a horticultural education event where we can give back to the community and we do so by um, having speakers we typically you know when we have our live on um, uh, our live site event we have booths and vendors but this year we continue with education by having some wonderful speakers which of course includes tony and um, if you need more information about denton county master gardeners we have an upcoming general meeting on october 14th you can always visit our website and find out what upcoming events we are hosting. And on October 14th, Nancy Nance and Jim Apkin from the Dallas Arboretum will talk about the plant trials. If you're interested in becoming Denton County Master Gardener, you can also visit our website and follow the links there to fill out an application. We're looking for those folks who wanna be a member of our 2021 class. We'll have, be hosting an, internet, uh, an informational meeting on October 20th, and once again, it's all this information is on our website, upcoming events. So please go check it out. Oh, so back to Tony. Um, so Tony, we're excited to hear what you have for us today with tips and to do's for North Central Texas gardening. Yes, okay, so you ready? Yes. All right, let's go. Um, it, it's a great time to be out in your garden. I, I was just mentioning, I feel bad that you're having to sit inside and, and watch a program, but hopefully this will get you inspired to get going. And there's lots to talk about. I've got a lot of slides, so I'm just gonna get into it right now. Um, first of all, uh, on our to-do list, early September. Now, Dr. Cummings spoke a lot about um, your lawns. So if you missed his talk, uh, they, this will be on YouTube later, so you can go back and review all that. But it's a, the first two things that I'm gonna talk about, it's really kind of late to be getting, doing those, so mark it on your list for next year. And basically I took my fall newsletter that I put on my blog and I turned it into this PowerPoint presentation. So all of these tips are on my newsletter as well and I will um, show you the link for that at the end of the talk. Uh, but early September is the time to fertilize your bed and your lawns. We wanna get our uh, plants, we've still got a lot of growing time going on and so you can get those things fertilized so that they can go into the winter uh, strong. And then again, pre-emergent control, Dr. Cummings spoke about that, but um, late, even late August, early September is the time to get that done to control spring weeds. Remember it's 
pre-emergent. If you see weeds in your lawn right now, like, um, uh, oh my goodness, what's the most common? Crabgrass. Uh, what you're applying now will not take care of that. You have to apply pre-emergent in March and June to control what you're seeing now. So anyway, go back and review his uh, talk for all of that information. I'll be talking about some pests to be on the lookout for this time of year. Then of course, fall is uh, prime time for planting. So we'll be going through all of those categories to talk about that. And then uh, any transplanting that you need to do, this is a great time of year to do that, whether it's shrubs or perennials. And then um, there's never a bad time to mulch your soil. Um, mulching, will conserve moisture, it will suppress weeds, it will continue to decompose and build up your soil. So anytime you have bare soil, it's a good time to mulch. And um, any mulch is better than no mulch. I prefer cedar, pine bark is fine, hardwood is fine. So anything that you can find locally is good. Uh, even leaves, you know, I'll talk about that later, chopping up your leaves and using those for mulch. So again, this is a little past due here, but I took this off Neil Sperry's site for treating um, pre-emergent treatment of spring weed control. So you can go to his website and find this exact information. Um, all right, some pests to be on the lookout for fall webworms. Um, I'm just starting to see these. You're gonna see these big nets that uh, some trees seem to be more susceptible to them. If you have uh, a long pole or rake that you can reach up and snag those um, uh, webs, then the birds can come in and take care of all those worms that are in there. It's kind of creepy to watch all those worms wiggling around inside those nets, but they're really not, they're not going to kill your tree. They may defoliate a section or two, but um, they will come back. If you want to, you can spray BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, which will take care of any caterpillar, including you know, our butterfly caterpillars. So, you know, be careful where you're using it. Um, it's a natural uh, organic um, material, but uh, just use it according to the label. Um, also aphids, uh, these are a soft bodied, bodied sucking insect and they usually can be taken care of with just a, a strong blast of water. But I, what I want you to notice in this picture is there's a hoverfly larva um, that will take care of those uh, aphids, and then also Dee also mentioned this, look for the lady beetle larva because the uh, hoverfly and the lady beetle larva are aphid eating machines. So I love it when nature takes care of itself. So we don't have to use pesticides all the time because um, nature by design takes care of itself. Also armyworms, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, um, this year, but the last couple of years, oh my goodness, they were marching across our lawns. So, um, you know, really, I don't think you can kill Bermuda grass, so they're just mowing it for you. But if you need to treat for them, again, you can use Bacillus thuringiensis or a, a spinosad product. Um, so just be on the lookout for those. And then something that I saw just a few weeks ago over at my church garden, uh, southern flannel moth caterpillars. These are a stinging venomous caterpillar. So stay clear of them. They can be treated with a pesticide if you have a severe infestation. And we did, there were hundreds on about three Yopon holly shrubs, absolutely covering these shrubs. You can see them all over in that picture there. But just, uh, they're gonna run their course. If, you, if you've just got a few of them, if you can stay clear of them, that might be the best option instead of having to spray them because they do turn into a southern flannel moth and at that point cease to be um, stinging and venomous. So um, uh, one thing, a client of mine just sent a picture of this and it's called woolly leaf gall uh, and she thought that she had the, the um, puss caterpillar but it turned out to just be a harmless gall so on her oak tree. Um, the galls are formed and a, a, a wasp will sting the leaf and then the gall is forming around that, that um, wasp sting. So uh, completely harmless, just know what you're dealing with before you treat. Okay, as I mentioned before, fall is ideal time for planting. Um, it's cooler, thank the Lord, it's cooler finally. It's easier on you, it's easier on the plants. Uh, plants have a longer time to establish before the heat of next summer because our soils are not freezing, so those roots can keep growing all winter long. Um, we don't usually have to worry too much about our winters, but summer 
uh, is when we want our plants to be tough and get through that. Uh, if you're needing to transplant, plants will suffer much less transplant shock this time of year because they're not um, having to battle the heat. Um, and then let's face it, we're gardeners, we all just want cheap plants, right? So, and lots of times nurseries have sales uh, this time of year because they're trying to uh, reduce inventory and, you know, fill the nursery with Christmas trees. So they'll have lots of sales going on this time of year. So be on the lookout. Uh, fall is the time to be planting wildflower seeds. Uh, one source for wildflower seeds would be the wildflower seed farm down in Fredericksburg. You can order in bulk if you need to there. Um, so our state flower, Texas blue bonnets, great wildflower to get planted right now. Larkspur, uh, these tall spires, it comes in blue uh, annuals. So if you collect the seeds after they've dried, then you can scatter them back in your garden. California poppies, a low growing, uh, just bright orange wildflower. Some Niferum poppies. Um, just gorgeous as a double uh, blooming variety. This is just a picture of, of the poppies blooming in my garden in the spring. Um, so if you are planting wildflowers, the, the details for that, you want a full sun spot, preferably six hours. Right now is the time to be, uh, anytime this month of October is a great time to get your wildflowers uh, scattered in. Just kind of scratch the soil so you, you have, you know, you're not throwing them on top of mulch. Um, so you want good soil contact. Usually these wildflower seeds are very, very tiny, so you don't need to cover them back up. If you do, just make sure it's no more than like an inch of compost, just very uh, light covering on them. One little tip on getting more even distribution is to take the seeds and mix them in with either sand or coffee grounds and maybe put them in an old spice shaker and just shake them around, um, or you can just toss them. And then you just water them a um, few days in a row, maybe watch the forecast. If we have a, a few days of rain in the forecast, it would be a great time to get them out before that. And you just watch them grow and bloom. They'll, they'll be blooming in the spring. And then after the seed pods completely dry, you have to let them go through that ugly period in order to get the, um, the seeds. So when you do plant them, though, remember where you planted them because uh, the, the little germinating seedlings kind of look like weeds, especially on those poppies. So um, over on the right-hand side, that's a picture of the pod that is formed after, the, of the, the seed pod after the bloom. And again, as I've mentioned, you gotta let that go completely dry. And you'll notice that kind of window that is right below the cap that's where the seeds will pour out of that. So you can collect them, give them to friends, scatter them back in your garden. Um, I can get as much as a half gallon baggie of poppy seeds from my poppies because I grow so many of them and I can't use that many in my garden, so I just give them away. Um, bulbs, it's a great time to be getting bulbs in the ground, right? Uh, anytime now through January is a good time. Uh, just a general rule of thumb, you want to plant dig a hole three times the height of your bulb. So if you have a little two inch bulb, you'll dig down about six inches, bury it that deeply. Again, anytime between now, mid-January is a great time to be putting in um, bulbs. So let's go through some bulbs. Daffodils need no pre-chilling. Um, they are very reliable here. I'm gonna go through some varieties that I grow that do very well in our area. Carlton is one of them, just your standard yellow single cup. Daffodil, Ice Follies is probably one of my favorite. It has that light uh, creamy white uh, background with a yellow center. Um, look for Tazetta varieties. They, are, they do better in the South. And instead of having a single cup uh, you, of, of a bloom, you'll have maybe five small cups on each stem and they are extremely fragrant. So be on the lookout for Tazetta varieties. Golden Dawn is another Tazetta variety that does well here. Tahiti is a double bloomer. Um, and then one of my new little favorites is this Tete-a-Tete -tete daffodil, and another one is called Minnow, and they only grow about six inches tall, so um, I just love them. One thing about daffodils, when they're done blooming and you just have the strap leaf foliage, you have to let that completely yellow. It's going to take somewhere between six and eight eight weeks for that to happen. So again, I have that love-hate relationship with daffodils. I love it when they're blooming. It just extends your spring bloom because some of them will start blooming in February, it's certainly into March. But then when you have to let them go through that yellowing period, they're not as attractive. So I try to plant them around other perennials that will grow up and hide that foliage. 
So you kind of get a good um, marriage of plants there cooperating. Um, some more bulbs, Spanish bluebells. Uh, I actually grow this underneath my deciduous trees because they, they will do quite well in a shadier um, area. And I love to plant these with uh, Texas gold columbine because they bloom at the same time of the year. So you get yellow and blue blooming at the same time in the spring. Beautiful. Uh, summer snowflake leucogym is another um, planted now, blooms in the spring with that little white bell-shaped bloom. A uh, couple other tiny bulbs, muscari, grape hyacinth, and then wisely blue starflower. Both of those do great here. They only grow about six inches tall, so put them at the edge of a, of a border. Um, and then Byzantine glad uh, will grow about two feet tall with that magenta bloom. They bloom a little bit later in the spring, more in the April time frame. Um, and then again, they're, you have to let their foliage die back um, and that they'll go dormant for the summer. Uh, St. Joseph's lily or hardy amaryllis, um, another great um, spring bloomer that can be planted now. Rain lilies, of course, these will bloom almost, you know, throughout the summer sporadically whenever we get a rain or uh, even into the fall, but you can go ahead and plant those now. Uh, we wish that we could grow tulips like this over, they do over in Holland, but um, yeah, not so much. Tulips here need pre-chilling. I'll talk about that in a minute, but we can grow species tulips. They're not quite as amazing, but they are sweet little bulbs that uh, will grow about six inches tall or so in your garden. So just, um, they do perennialize here. Um, so if you do want to grow tulips, hyacinth or, or crocus in our area, you need to pre-chill those bulbs um, 45 degrees for 45 days. Um, just throw them in your refrigerator bin. Um, and then you will plant them or, you know, in December, early January timeframe when our soils are at that 45 to 50 degree uh, temperature. Um, a way you can figure out your soil temperature, if you take the high temperature of the day and the low temperature of the day for about three, four days and you average that out, that gives you a general idea of what your soil temp is. So, all right, you can also plant bulbs in containers. I did this last year and um, I had great success with it. I, again, I pre-chilled the bulbs then I planted them in the container. So this diagram, I don't even know what a tree lily is, but it, it's just basically showing the size of your bulb. The bigger it is, the deeper it's planted, and then you can layer them up with smaller bulbs. So this is what I did. I planted tulips, I pre-chilled them, planted them in the pot, and then I planted violas over top of them. So the violas were blooming all winter long, or pansies, um, and you know, same thing. And then the tulips in the springtime started popping up. So it's just, I mean, on a gray, uh, you know, late winter day, when you see these tulips start popping up, it's just so fun. All right, so garden clubs and master gardeners, a lot of times will have bulb sales in the fall. So be looking for those. There are also online resources for fall bulbs, like, or spring bulbs, um, like Brent and Becky's and Southern Bulb Company. So look for those. Um, there are fall blooming bulbs. Um, if you planted them now, you've probably missed that bloom time, but go ahead and get them in the ground and then you'll have them ready for next year. This is ox blood lily or uh, schoolhouse lilies. They usually start blooming right about the time that kids are going back to school. And then um, this is Lycoris radiata or red spider lily, same thing. They will send up their blooms in the fall and then the blooms will fade and they will send up foliage then that will be there all winter long. And then that foliage will start dying back next spring, um, early summer. So then they go dormant for the summer and repeat bloom in the fall. Another fun fall blooming bulb that I have is called um, Sternbergia lutea, or the common name is autumn crocus, sometimes, sometimes called a winter daffodil. So this is just a really bright, cheerful, I just posted about this one on my Facebook page. Um, so fall or win and winter veggies, here's just a general list of what can be planted in our area now. Um, of course, Dee did a great program on veggie gardening. If you want to go back and catch Dee Nash's uh, veggie program that was given earlier today, it'll be on the uh, DCMGA website for a couple weeks, I understand. Um, but one thing I just want to point out, if you will go to aggiehorticulture.tamu.u and you will uh, search for their fall planting guide, it will pull up this, uh, this planting guide. And in North Central Texas, we are in region three. 
So you can find the vegetable that you want to plant, look over in that region three column, and you can see exactly when the best planting time is. Um, don't recommend uh, fall tomatoes at this point because they need to be planted in July. So you've got to get them planted so that they can be, um, have time to set fruit and, and be ripe before we get our first freeze. All right, so uh, fall is an excellent time to be planting trees. So I'm just going to kind of go through some specifics on that. You know, dig your hole. You want to rough your sides of your hole up. You don't want this nice, slick, super um, <laughs> neat hole. Um, and so then you take your tree out of the pot. And um, when trees are container grown in the nursery, you know, they're starting out as small trees and they keep potting them up into larger sizes. And so, you know, they're throwing soil in there every time they pot it up. And by the time you buy this tree, a lot of times it's already a couple inches too deep uh, in the pot. So when you pull it out of the pot, take a broom or um, just your hand and just kind of brush that top soil off until you get to what is the flare of the trunk. And you can see that flare uh, where the tr straight trunk starts to flare out at the root ball. That is what is considered the top of the root ball. Um, so then you will uh, cut the sides of the um, um, root ball. Just uh, You don't have to, but check and see if they have any circling roots and you want to cut those or at least rough them up so you encourage the roots to start going out laterally. If you don't, a lot of times you can uh, develop these girdling roots that will grow in a circle and end up strangling your tree. So you can take care of that from the get-go. Um, then you're going to place the plant in the hole with that root flare that I just talked about a couple inches above your soil grade. And then you will backfill with only the soil that came out of that hole. You never want to add planting amendments into the hole because think about it, the roots of this tree are going to be out as wide as the canopy of the tree and wider. So making that little hole in the ground all cushy is just not necessary. You want those roots in native soil immediately and ready to go out. And then you can add some root stimulator, liquid or um, granular root stimulator to that hole and then water it in well and get that soil settled around that root ball. You don't want any air pockets around it. So you can add compost to the top of the root ball once it's planted and then just kind of feather that out and you can mulch the top of the root ball um, and then you will probably need to supplement this uh, tree with water for that first year or two, especially during the following summer because it's not I'm going to be quite established yet. Um, one thing I want to caution on, do not mulch up around the trunk of the tree. We call these mulch volcanoes. I see this all the time. You want to get the mulch off of that trunk because it can bring decay in at the bottom of the um, trunk. So um, if you have to stake a tree, um, I don't usually recommend it because the trees tend, tend to be a little stronger rooted in if they're not staked, but sometimes we have these high wind situations, especially if you're a little farther west in um, North Texas. Um, anyway, if you do have to wrap it and stake it, um, be sure to remove those after a, a year. One thing I do want to point out, one reason for wrapping on shumard and Chinese pistache is sun scald. You will usually see this on the west and the southwest side of the tree where that sun is just literally burning the trunk and it splits open. And then that is just an invitation for borers to attack your, attack your tree. And if I can show you here with my cursor, if you see this roll of bark on each side of that, um, that is the tree healing or compartmentalizing that wound. So the tree can survive it, uh, but it, it, you know, you, this is totally preventable if you will just wrap that tree for a couple years. That's really easy. It's just paper tree wrap. You can usually find it at any big box store or nursery. Um, so again, if you do have to stake your tree, be sure to remove that staking within a year. Um, this was at a client of mine and their tree was in trouble and I walked up to it and I thought, oh my goodness, the staking material had been on there for over three years and had literally embedded into the trunk of that tree. We dug it out, I called the arborist and she said it can survive it, but it can make it more susceptible to breakage at that point because the trunk is so weak and this tree ended up dying. So again, remove that staking. 
Um, okay, mistletoe is a problem that you're going to start seeing in the winter time. Um, uh, mistletoe is a parasite. It actually grows into the branch of the tree. They have root-like structures called historia, and those roots grow into the branch. So if it's possible that you can, uh, if it's a branch, maybe one branch, and you can cut the branch off a foot beyond where the mistletoe attaches, you can get rid of it. But sometimes, uh, in, like in the picture I've shown there, it's so thick and it's so high, it's, it's not practical. You can't get to that. So sometimes um, it, it just is what it is. There are some trees that are more susceptible to it. If you keep a healthy tree, don't bury it too deeply, you know, plant it correctly from the get-go, uh, don't mulch up on it. You know, the tree is gonna be healthier and hopefully be able to fight this off. Um, if it's low enough and you, you don't wanna cut the branch off because it might disfigure your tree, maybe you can at least cut the mistletoe off where it connects um, and, and keep it from going to seed and spreading even more. Okay, some more tips. Let's start cutting back on our watering. Um, you know, I would recommend just putting your controller on off right now and running it manually only when needed. Uh, we have the big word there is evapotranspiration. Evaporation is a soil, a, a water leaving soil by evaporating and transpiration is water leaving plant leaves. We perspire, plants transpire. So evapotranspiration is much less in these cooler temperatures than it is in the summertime. So you don't have to water as often. If you do, when you do water, water very deep, deeply and infrequently. I always recommend doing that cycle and soak method where instead of running your system, for instance, 20 minutes once, run it twice for 10 minutes. So it gives it time to uh, soak in between each cycle. You get much deeper uh, soaking of the moisture. Do not water at night, dark and wet equals fungus. So water early, early morning, right before sunrise. Um, and yes, I'm, I start running mine in the wee hours of the morning, but it's, you know, anything after say three or four in the morning, it's still dark, but sun is coming up quickly. So you don't wanna water it like at 10 o'clock at night and then it's sitting wet all night long. In the winter, we only need to water uh, maybe once every two weeks if we've not gotten rain. If we get rain, start the counter, you know, over again. And uh, if the next time we haven't had rain for two weeks, go ahead and run your system if you need because, um, but check your soil too, if it's, our, if it's still moist. Um, certainly water before freeze. Okay, lawns, if you do need to plant sod, uh, get on that right away, especially if it's St. Augustine, because St. Augustine only grows above ground stolons, uh, as opposed to Bermuda and Zoysia that grow with underground rhizomes and stolons. So you wanna get those that, that the sod uh, rooted in before freezing temperatures are coming. So you'll water it 10 minutes a day for about two weeks and get that rooted in. So time's kind of of the essence on that. If you start seeing a large patch or brown patch in your St. Augustine, uh, you may need to treat with a fungicide. Um, I've had some success with top dressing with peat moss or compost, but you're gonna see these rings starting to form. Uh, the cooler wet uh, weather just kind of brings that in with St. Augustine. So just be on the lookout for that. And then you don't wanna do any hard pruning right now. I've got a, I'll be talking about late winter pruning in just a minute, but just only light tidy up pruning now. In, in January and February, you can just go crazy with it, but just take it easy right now. Continue deading, deadheading your perennials and deadheading just means removing spent blooms. So you can keep those plants blooming. In the fall, we have like the second spring where all of our perennials are just blooming their heads off right now. Uh, leaves, to leave or not to leave. I know Dr. Cummings spoke about this as well. I do mow my leaves on the lawn areas. I leave beds, in, I leave leaves in my beds just to add that extra layer of protection for the winter. And then um, if you have an abundance of leaves, you can just chop them up, um, then run through them with your mower with the bagger attached on it. And then you can throw those leaves in the compost pile. Um, if you want to get your compost pile heating up very quickly, add a cottonseed meal. It will, um, it's cheap. You can buy like a 40 pound bag for 10 bucks or something and that will last you a very long time. Just take maybe like a coffee can size of cottonseed meal and throw it in your compost pile and it will get it cooking. So, and you can also chop your leaves up and add them back into the beds. 
So they will continue to decompose, but you don't want to leave them on your lawn because that just traps up moisture underneath there. And again, dark and wet equals fungus. We don't want to keep breeding fungal problems on our lawns. All right, so before a freeze, um, you want to water deeply and then turn those sprinklers off because we don't want uh, slip and slide sidewalks. And then if you need to protect any tender plants, uh, you can buy this frost blanket or frost cloth. It's just very light fabric that will give you several degrees of protection on anything that's a little uh, marginal maybe. Um, I don't do a lot of this because um, I need easy. Uh, all right, so then after the freeze, you're gonna be asking, is it dead or is it dormant? I always have to encourage my clients, learn that dormant word. Just because it looks dead doesn't mean that it is. It's probably alive, it just went dormant taking a rest. So our hardiness zone here in North Central Texas is 7B, 8A, right in there. When you're buying new plants, I always encourage people to look for that sweet spot of hardiness, which is zone six through nine. Six gives us an extra cushion on cold tolerance and nine gives us an extra tolerance on heat. So look for plants in that area and you will not have to worry about babying anything. Um, but if you're buying annuals, you're gonna see on the tag that it usually says zone 10 or zone 11, they're gonna freeze here because uh, we're zone eight. So uh, there's sometimes you'll put in plants that are called marginally hardy. You know, you'll find something in the 8B, the nine uh, zone range, like for instance, uh, Esperanza or Mexican milkweed. Um, they may overwinter and they may not. If we have a really cold winter, they might not make it, but they might. So they're marginal. Just, um, I wouldn't plant my whole garden with them, but if you wanna try some uh, in, in that marginal range, maybe put it in a, a protected spot in your yard, um, just Google the plant uh, before you buy it and, and know the hardiness zone on it before you put it in the ground so you don't have to do so much protecting. Um, so dormant. Um, Hardy perennials go into dormancy as soon as we have that first freeze. Again, their tops might look dead, but their roots are very much alive and they will flourish again the next season. So for instance, here's tropical giant spider lily. I grow this all over my garden. It says it's tropical, but that's name only. As soon as our first freeze, it's gonna look like that. And then next spring, it will come right back. I promise you. And uh, leopard plant, I grow this in the, um, shady parts of my garden and it blooms in November, but it's gonna be flat as a pancake, first freeze. Don't worry, it'll come back. Uh, wood ferns, um, they do great in my garden in the summertime, but the first freeze, they're a brown pile. So um, you'll cut those back after they look like that, but they'll come back, they'll come back. Here's just a listing that I have of, of perennials that you can cut back to the ground after the first freeze. Now, one thing I, I say, if, you, if the, particular perennial has any seed heads or it gives any cover for uh, birds or any other wildlife um, lizards and you want to leave it over the winter by all means you don't have to cut it down it's not going to matter on the the health or hardiness of the plant it's just whether you like a really tidy garden or it's not as important to you so just a quick list you can again this list is on my uh, newsletter and um, you can take a screenshot of it now and again my program will be up on their youtube channel later if you want to review this list again uh, so again some some perennials go dormant but they still have some winter and in interest or texture that i leave them until doing that late winter pruning for instance salvia gregii um, I wait until February. Um, asters, I wait until February. Ornamental grasses, I love ornamental grasses in the wintertime here. They just add so much texture. So um, anyway, roses, uh, wait to prune those in um, February if you still have them. I do wanna talk a little bit about rose rosette. If you are not familiar with this, I'm begging you to please dig these roses out and get rid of them. You're gonna be looking for excessive thorns, um, very gnarly red uh, pigmentation on the new growth. And that's not to say that if it has red growth, a new red growth, that it has rose rosette because that is the characteristic of some roses. But if it's really distorted, uh, for instance, in this picture here, you will see those malformed leaves. And if you see that, you need to dig the rose up roots and all, bag it up and throw it in the trash. Um, 
because it is spread by a microscopic mite. And if you leave that sick rose in your garden, you basically have a reservoir of disease that is spreading um, the disease to every, all your neighbors. And I'm still seeing it as I'm driving around, I'm still seeing it in neighborhoods just all over the place. Um, all right, so there are evergreen perennials um, that you don't have to prune. Um, you can do a little tidy up on them, but they don't need pruning um, now. And uh, maybe in February, you can give them a little tidy up and prune if you need to. Here's just a list of those. I'm gonna go into a few specifics on these in just a minute. Of course, herbs, if you wanna trim those back, now you can do that and give them a flush of new fall growth. Um, herbs like to be pruned, so they like to be cut and eaten. So um, there are some dormant perennials that you don't prune. <laughs> I'm sure you're so confused by now. But for instance, hydrangea, the, the mop head, macrophylla, or quercifolia, um, oak leaf hydrangeas, their leaves are going to look like this when it freezes. Those leaves will dry up and fall off, and you're just going to have sticks. But hydrangeas, these particular types of hydrangeas bloom on old growth. So if you prune these stems off thinking they're dead, you have just now sacrificed next spring's bloom and that's why we grow these plants. So wait, if you have to prune them, wait until immediately after they're done blooming, which is gonna be sometime in the July timeframe that you would cut them back. So that gives them time to regrow and be able to produce blooms the next year. Some of our shrubs are evergreen and they look like they're frozen, but they're not. Uh, this is a cuba, gold dust acuba. When it freezes, it looks like this, but as soon as the temperature gets back above 32, it looks like nothing happened. So you don't need to do a thing. Don't freak out. It's just gonna be fine as soon as the temperature are back above freezing. If you're totally overwhelmed and this is your first time pruning, uh, I feel for you. Um, I do have a late winter pruning newsletter that I do put on my blog. Um, and I also have that link to a YouTube video that I have done on pruning. So you can go back and review that. Um, it can be intimidating, but if you will do that late winter pruning um, in February, late January, anytime in the month of February, you can cut things severely without hurting them. All right, pruning is, the timing is critical on this. Plants are storing energy all winter long. They're ready to put that burst of growth in the springtime, so that pruning is gonna stimulate that new growth. Um, so if you do it too early, it's gonna stimulate growth and then it could get burned off with a freeze. If you wait till after they grow in the springtime, then they've wasted all that energy and you've cut off all that beautiful new growth. We want the benefit of all that new growth. So the time to do that is late January through mid-February, which gives the plant a, you know, about a month to regrow. And at that time, we're usually done with freezes in mid-March. And th then you can enjoy all that new growth. And you can prune hollies severely, uh, uh, safely by a third. And I would even suggest as much as half of the plant, and they will be just fine. Um, if you have a question whether what you're about to cut is dead or alive, if you'll just take your fingernail or your little pruning tool and make a little scratch in the stem, if it's green underneath, it's still alive. If it's tan or brown underneath, it's a goner. All right, um, this is something we want to stop pruning. Please, let's stop cr pruning uh, crepe murder, uh, committing crepe murder. Um, you know, there are crepe myrtles that grow three feet tall and 30 feet tall and everything in between and any color you want. So choose the variety at the mature height that you want so that we don't have to keep doing that practice. Nandinas, uh, I've said this before, I'm on a mission to save the poor Nandinas. They have such a bad name. Um, this is a non-spreading variety called Gulfstream. It should never ever be hedged. Put the hedge trimmers away. All Nandinas are pruned, uh, taking one third of the tallest canes to the ground every February. You prune them once a year. These are my Gulfstream Nandinas that have been in my garden for 22 years. I prune them once a year and they look just like that today. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of Nandina it is, they're all pruned the same. One third of the tallest gains to the ground mid-February, they will be great. It forces growth at the bottom of the plant, they stay bushier and more compact that way. If you don't do this, then they will get tall and lanky. Okay, Yopon hollies, um, I prefer them cut in the a shape of a dome. Um, I've said before, if you could take an umbrella and take the, the handle off and just set the umbrella over your shrub, that's the shape that is a really pretty shape for Yopon hollies. 
uh, the little shrub form. Instead of cutting them in, if I can get my cursor to work here, um, instead of cutting them in at the bottom right here, you don't want to do that. You want that growth to come down all the way down to the ground. Okay, um, another kind of yopon holly is the tree form, and I'm trying to get people to quit lollipopping and mushrooming them. It's a lot of maintenance and it can be dangerous because you're up on a roof or you're on a ladder and it's much easier if you will just let the yopon holly tree grow out. Um, just start uh, limbing it up, meaning cutting the bottom um, limbs off and just exposing those bottom trunks and letting the top grow out naturally because it's no maintenance at that point. Um, and then you can actually see out your windows. So it, it will take about a three year period of time. And um, it is it, it's just a beautiful end result, I think. Okay, ground covers, especially the ryope, late winter is the time to get those pruned. And um, you must have this done before March uh, because they start sending up their new growth and they send it up once a year. So if you cut that new growth off, then you're gonna have um, tattered ends and flat ends and uh, Liriope has a pointy end. So you wanna make sure you get that done in February. You can just take a weed eater, chop it down. Um, any Liriope, doesn't matter what variety it is. Um, this is what not to do. We call this Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is not how to prune a tree in the winter time. The winter is an ideal time to prune trees, but um, let me just give you a little quickie uh, instruction. If you, first of all, I would recommend calling a certified arborist to trim your trees um, so that you can be safe. But if you can safely reach a limb that needs to come off, the first thing you wanna do is that number one cut. If I can get my cursor right here. You do a little undercut about halfway through the branch, um, about a foot away from the trunk. Then you want to come and make this number two cut right here, uh, just beyond that undercut. And you cut the whole branch off. And the point of that is to get the weight off of that uh, branch. Then you can come back and make your number three cut, um, which is your final cut right on the outside of that branch collar, it's called. You'll usually see that ridge. It's a branch bark ridge. It's very usually very evident. Don't leave a stub come, cut, and don't cut into that ridge, but just on the outside of it, make that cut. I do want to caution you, red oaks and live oaks need to be cut in the dead of winter or the dead of summer, but preferably before February 15th to prevent oak wilt. And um, if you, if you, pruning pain is usually not recommended, only on oaks, so don't have to worry about that. Um, winter is a good time to just kind of sit back and evaluate your garden, look at what worked over the season, what didn't, what you want to add. Um, do you want to add new bed areas? Can you do your bed prep in the winter time? Um, it's just a time to start thinking about those things. And then I'm going to be talking about um, garden bones and adding evergreens and structures to your garden so that it's interesting even in the winter. So um, Getting down to the bare bones. Those garden bones are the structures in a garden that add interest no matter what season it is. So that can be trees or evergreens or, or pathways or water features, boulders. I love boulders. Um, Sherry and I were just talking about that earlier. Um, arbors, gazebos, benches, things like that, garden ornaments. Um, so this is my garden in the middle of um, probably June, um, blooming its head off. But this is how it looks in the winter time after I've done my late winter prune back and clean up. So um, it's, you can still see the structure of the garden. You can you know, see I've got a fountain in there and a bird bath and some little um, um, obelisk in there. And I've got a few evergreens in there. I'd probably need to add some more. I will be evaluating my garden this winter for exactly that. But then just look at it through the seasons. This is uh, the top picture is right after a freeze and the next picture is in you know, obviously when we've had some snow so you can still see the structure of the garden and there's still some evergreen elements in there. This is my backyard in the summertime um, but this is how it looks in the wintertime so you can still see the shape of the lawn you can still see the walkway I've got a bench I've got a trellis uh, arbor I've got the large evergreen um, magnolia there you can see the red of the stems of the Japanese maple, sango kaku, or coral bark maple that I have in the background there. So you still have some interesting elements and bones in your garden. Um, so maybe that can be in the form of statuary or a bench or again, a, an arbor. Um, maybe you wanna add some evergreen shrubs. Um, this is cast iron and Oakland holly in my garden. So just to add that 
um, evergreen interest in your garden, or maybe you want to add a plant that will bring in um, berries or bring in wildlife because of the berries or just the color. This is a possum haw holly with the berries in the wintertime. And so this is just a picture of my garden in the winter. I love ornamental grasses in the wintertime. I think they add so much interest and texture and movement. Even though they've gone dormant and they're brown, I just still think they look great. But that's totally personal choice. It's not a bad thing to cut them back in the fall if you don't like that look. But start thinking about bark. Uh, this is a Natchez crepe myrtle on the right-hand side with that beautiful cinnamon-colored bark. And then this is a Chinese pistache on the left-hand side. Um, just interesting bark. You, you start seeing your garden differently when you don't have so much competition from, from all the blooms and everything else growing. Uh, boulders, again, I love boulders. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, uh, in a creek bed, one thing maintenance-wise that you need to do is blow those leaves out because the leaves will decompose and turn to compost and fill up your creek bed and then it won't function as intended. The point of a creek bed is to carry water through it and if you let that fill up with debris the next thing you know it's going to be higher than the surrounding soil and your water is going to move off to the side. So you want to keep those just take a blower and just blow that out. If you have a lawn crew that does that for you just ask them blow out my creek bed every single week. All right, or you might just want to add garden ornaments to your uh, garden with like a bottle tree or some metal ornaments or something just to keep it interesting in the wintertime when everything is dormant. All right, so now I quickly want to run through some plant material that give a fall and winter um, color and interest. So again, this is our giveaway today, this uh, 100 top 100 plants for North Central Texas. I'll be going over some of the fall bloomers and winter interest plants um, in this card deck. So I hope you win. Um, again, perennials, we'll start with that. Um, salvia, oh my goodness, I cannot have a garden, a full sun garden without salvias. They do so well here in our um, heat. Um, it brings in gobs of pollinators, honeybees, bumblebees. Of course, monarch butterflies are coming through um, now this time of year. We're on their flight pattern um, from Canada down to Mexico. Um, any salvia is a good salvia. Salvia gregii, this is my favorite perennial of all. I mean, look at that. What is not to love about this? This is growing at my church garden and you can see it driving by because it's just so bright. Um, attracts hummingbirds like crazy. Uh, my tip on this is if you will cut this back to six inches every February, now it's gonna grow two and a half to three feet tall and wide cut it back to six inches in February and it will keep it from getting woody and rangy. Um, Mexican mint marigold is also called Texas tarragon. So you can, anything that you would cook with tarragon, you can use Mexican mint marigold. I love to plant it with Mexican bush sage because yellow and purple, as Dee talked about those color opposites, they just look great together in the garden and they bloom at the same time. Um, my tip on Mexican mint marigold and Texas, um, or Mexican bush sage, actually any fall blooming plant is if you will trim it in half by about the July time frame, it will send up more stems and be um, make the plant a little shorter to be able to support all of those fall blooms. If you don't do that, a lot of times they can grow fairly tall and then the weight of the blooms will make the, the plant flop over. So about July 4th or so, cut those off. Garlic chives, um, oh my goodness, they are, I always know that I've survived another Texas summer when I see my garlic chives blooming. So it's always a welcome sight in the in the September time frame, late August, early September. And the bees absolutely love this, uh, completely edible. Oh, it's just a wonderful garlic, spicy garlic flavor. So just cut the, um, you can eat the blooms. They're just amazing. Uh, fall aster, I know Dee talked about how she loves aster in her garden. It's a very late late bloomer. I wish it bloomed longer, but when it does, it is just glorious with all these um, hundreds, thousands of purple blooms on it. Uh, great perennial for our area. American Beauty Berry is for maybe more shady areas. This can grow. I keep mine at about four feet by pruning it back every February down to about 18 inches, but I have a client who has Beauty Berry growing about eight feet tall and wide. It's spectacular. They never prune it. There's a purple uh, berry variety and a white berry variety. And thank you to my friend Wanda for sending me the picture of her white um, berry variety. I just have purple. Um, Turk's cap. 
um, hummingbird magnet. This was taken at another Master Gardener project over in Collin County at Myers Park and Event Center. They have a research garden over there that I would uh, recommend going, if, you know, if you want to see a demonstration garden on um, hardy plants for our area. It's a great demonstration garden. And Tarrant County has a great demonstration uh, garden as well, giving a shout out to my peeps. Um, but per Turk's cat blooms in the fall. Um, again, hummingbird attractor, very drought tolerant. Uh, I always tell people my whole garden is going to be Turk's cap and purple heart by the time I'm done because it can handle sun, shade, whatever, it'll grow. Uh, monarch magnets, we want to grow milkweed. Um, that's the little egg that you're going to see on the back of a milkweed leaf. A leaf and then here's your a, a caterpillar and then they turn into these beautiful um, monarchs. And their plant of choice is milkweed. Um, of course, one is the tropical milkweed or Mexican milkweed and then the other one is our native um, tuberosa variety. So they need this plant to um, continue on. And another um, monarch magnet is Greg's mist flower. Um, now, just one caveat on this plant, it can be quite aggressive, so give it lots of room or keep it in bounds, but it will attract monarchs like nothing else. Um, all right, Copper Canyon Daisy, very late bloomer, maybe even into the November time frame, but and it has a very strong smelling foliage that you either love or hate, but it does very well here. Um, leopard plant, I grow leopard plant instead of hostas. I don't think hostas do as well here in our area because of the heat and the slugs and the snails and you name it. Um, but I grow leopard plant and it blooms in about November with these really pretty daisy-like blooms. And if you will let those go to seed, um, then they will scatter around your garden and you might even get some babies. I have lots of baby feedling uh, leopard plant in my garden. Uh, Lenten rose is another winter bloomer. This is gonna bloom in the late January, February timeframe. One of my favorite varieties is this Frost Kiss line called Molly's White. I love white in the wintertime because you, I've got leaf debris uh, that I leave in my beds and so this white will just shine. If I use something pink, it kind of fades into the leaf debris color. So I just love the white blooming hellebores. Um, just a close up of some other bloomers, uh, Blenton Rose. Um, and a lot of them hang down. Um, so you kind of have to, you know, appreciate your garden from all angles um, so that because they grow low to the ground and um, to add some evergreen interest with fern this is holly fern it's it is a, a evergreen um, you might have to do a little tidy up on this in the springtime if they have any brown bronze on it if you see this on the back of your leaves do not fear this is just a uh, baby ferns in the making, they're little fern spores. We just don't have the right climate here to, um, that they will propagate. You know, you need a very moist um, environment and we just don't have that here in the summer. Uh, another evergreen fern is autumn fern that puts out this beautiful uh, coppery fo new foliage. Um, ornamental grasses, I love, love, love ornamental grasses. Cannot design a garden without them when we have full sun. This is pink muley and another one of my favorites is pine muley. Um, pine muley doesn't have um, the pink color to it, but it's got a very erect uh, form and they both stay fairly small um, in the less than three foot range. So easy to tuck into a garden. This is the big brother of the muleys. This is Lindheimer's muley native, but it'll grow about five feet tall or so. And it has just that beautiful, that it's called inflorescence, their, um, their um, seed head. Um, this is Miscanthus um, adagio, one of my favorite grasses, um, and I just love how it looks in the fall. Uh, with the, even the foliage will cover up on it, color up on it. So that's why I like to leave it through after its dormant uh, period. So moving into some shrubs, camellias um, are fall or winter bloomers. Actually, I take that back. Fall bloomers. This is Camellia sasanqua. They bloom in the fall. Camellia japonica will bloom in the winter. You're probably going to have more success with Camellia sasanqua because they bloom usually before it freezes and the japonicas sometimes can get nipped by a freeze in January. So um, they do prefer acidic soil. So you want, might want to get a soil test before you try these. Um, and you can go to, what is it, soiltesting.tamu.edu to get information on that. Uh, nandinas, again, I like nandinas. These are the non-spreading uh, varieties. Um, they are not invasive at all. They don't produce any berries. 
um, but they give amazing color in the winter time. Um, there's Gulfstream, there's Nana or Firepower, Blush is a new variety, Obsession. They all are excellent for um, either shade or sun. They do just amazing in our area. No, they're not native, but they do very well in our area. And so you want to look for native and adapted plants, plants that have adapted to our area. Japanese Aurelia is an evergreen um, that will bloom these interesting white puppy blooms in usually December, January timeframe. Um, I, I had mentioned this one before, the possum haw holly. Um, it loses its leaves in the wintertime, but then um, it retains the berries and then the cedar wax wings will come up, you know, fly in um, in just <laughs> droves in like the January, February timeframe and they will clean your berries off um, in a day. And then this is Yopon Holly. This is the evergreen version of that. And so it retains the, the leaves and it colors up with the berries. And again, the cedar wax wings love this. There's a weeping variety of, of Yopon Holly tree. And then there's this, the upright standard variety that I had, the one that I showed you before um, where I wanna have you quit mushrooming it, mushrooming or lollipopping and it letting it grow out, let it grow out naturally. And then you have all these pretty berries to boot. Um, Akuba is, um, a great shade loving parent or a shrub has to have shade. If you, it's, again, it gets any sun, it will turn black, um, but it produces these red berries. There's a solid green variety of it. And then of course there's the gold dust with the yellow speckles on it. Excellent shrubs for our areas, area. Coral berry will bloom in the winter time. If you want to see it blooming, you can go to the Fort Worth uh, Botanic Gardens and see that there. Um, Mahonia is a winter bloomer. It puts the, these yellow um, blooms on it and then they're followed up by these bluish uh, berries. This is leather leaf Mahonia. It can be a little prickly. Um, this is for shade. Um, there's a soft caress variety, which is a newer variety. I would caution you to put that in a protected spot. I have had freeze damage on mine where it's frozen to the ground and it comes back. But where I want an evergreen that's going to be three to four feet tall, I don't want to start from the ground every year. So make sure you put that in a protected spot. Winter jasmine, another winter bloomer. Um, just an up close of that. Again, this was taken at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, so you can go see it there to see if you like it. Uh, purple winter creeper is a ground cover that is purple in the winter, hence the name. So it grows kind of like Asian jasmine, but it does color up in the wintertime. Um, yikes, this was in February of 2010. Um, I, don't care to see that again. Um, all right, some cool season annual color uh, for your container or your garden. One thing I wanna caution you on is to plant or buy your, your annuals in bud, not in full bloom. So when you go to the nursery and you see the pot of beautiful blooming, whatever, look beside it to get the one in bud and buy that one so you get full benefit of the blooms. Um, some fall uh, color, uh, crotons or chrysanthemums. Now these are not going to survive a freeze, but if you've got a little gathering at your house in the fall and you want to spoof, you know, spiff it up a little bit, you can add some croton or chrysanthemum. Um, Celosia is also a great fall bloomer. Um, purple fountain grass, chili pepper, ornamental chili peppers will color up in the um, um, fall. And then pansies and kale pretty much can handle anything our Texas winter will dish out. So plant all you want. Dianthus, again, will handle just about anything Texas can give out. And Dusty Miller, another great um, winter annual. Um, some others to consider, parsley, Swiss chard, uh, you can read the list there. These will need a little bit of protection, so um, you may not want to plant a lot of these in your garden because they can suffer when we get down into the teens, uh, whereas pansies and kale can handle that. Um, Trees for fall color, very quickly, Chinese pistache, amazing fall color. There's a female variety that has some berries on it. I don't care for the female, but um, try to get the male. Um, red oak, Schumard red oak, um, they do not like wet feet, so make sure you put it in an area with good drainage. Excellent red fall color. Shantung maple, there's a yellow uh, fall color, and there's another one called fire dragon with red fall color. You can get those at Metro Maples down in Kennedale. Excellent resource for maples. Um, ginkgo, the cool thing about ginkgo is they drop all their leaves in just a day. So you don't have a lot of uh, stretched out leaf cleanup, all drops in a day. Um, beautiful yellow color. Crepe myrtles have a lot of really pretty fall color. Uh, this is Natchez with that beautiful orange fall color. 
Texas ash, yellow fall color. Cedar elms, again, yellow fall color. Uh, red maples, they can uh, be a little more stressed in times of drought, but oh, beautiful red, red, red fall color on those couple varieties listed there. Um, I grow Japanese maples in my shady backyard and um, December, first week of December is when they start to color up. So lots of color from the, that foliage, just another view of that. And then a few that we don't want to grow because they may have pretty fall color, but their beauty is only skin deep. These are not recommended for our area. Now, if you have these trees, I'm not saying go out and cut them down, but don't buy them um, and, and plant them new. And then last but not least, I hope that you will take some time after you get all your chores done to rest and relax a little bit and then get ready because spring is right around the corner, right? We're, we're all waiting for spring. Um, so just some reference sites here. Uh, if you have questions about anything, I just would say Google it and add T-A-M-U E-D-U after it because you will get uh, Texas A&M University Research Information. Any topic that you want to Google, add T-A-M-U to it and you'll get that information. Water University, uh, Save Tarrant Water. I've done some programs for them that are on their website that you can watch about um, landscape design. Uh, of course, Neil Sperry, any um, Master Gardener Association in your area, you, whatever your county is, they have great resources for you. So check them out. I do, again, have a blog and Facebook page so you can access that. I, I try to do informative stuff on there, not just pretty pictures, um, although they're inspiring as well. But um, let's see, some other resources. These are my top uh, four favorite uh, resources that I use all the time, especially um, Steve Huddleston's Easy Gardens for North Central Texas. Um, he's out of Fort Worth and he knows our area. So everything in his book, I highly recommend. So, all right, uh, that's it. I hope I didn't take too long. Um, if we have any questions, I would um, do my best to answer them. We have a few questions, but I was yes. going to see if we could direct those either to your blog or to your Facebook page. Sure. And people as a follow-up could go visit and ask those questions directly. Yes. We're, we kind of, um, we have a tight schedule in between our talks and, and I, we want to do our giveaways and, and, and all that. So I, there was one question asking if you did have a, a handout for your presentation. I th basically the handout would be the fall um, and late winter newsletter. So I have okay. a fall newsletter and then I have a late winter newsletter. So if you will find those on my blog, it's free information. You don't have to sign up for anything. You can just go on the blog site and access them. And again, all of the same information it is on there. Right. So, so go to signature garden blogspot.com and you can look up this information that Tony's presented as if, if you need more um, variety, names of varieties and information. So that'd be excellent. Tony, and I link that newsletter on my Facebook page. So, so check, it's check seasonal. It out I just do a few a year. I, it's, you know, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna also say that Tony is, uh, does different talks throughout North Texas through Tarrant County Master Gardeners and through TRWD. And so um, when you sign up or follow her on her Facebook page, um, she will post when she's uh, presenting. Mm -hmm. We'll do our polls here really quick. Where do y'all live? And um, please submit that and we'll see what, what pops up. I'm going to head and share my page. And thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. So a lot of folks from Denton County, we got someone visiting from Oklahoma and people from outside DFW. So we're, we're glad that this information that, you know, is out there and they can utilize it too. You have some great information. So these are the different uh, ways that we advertise our event. So if you could let us know how you heard about it, we'd appreciate that. And I know Betsy coming up, she's going to have great information on native plants. Absolutely. Um, I focus more on native and adapted, but she'll, she'll focus more on the native end of the scheme. And a lot of folks found out this through the website and the Facebook page and through our newsletter. So, Oh, uh, I love your roots newsletter. Oh, I love it. Thank you. So if you're not subscribed to the DCMGA newsletter, you can go to our website 
and we would love to have you sign up for it. You can always access our um, previous issues. They're all listed there. We also have an index if you're looking for information on a specific plant or topic. So please go to our website. Um, we're, you know, we're not gathering information from those folks signed up today. We're not going to meet, we can't sign you up for stuff. You know, we need your permission and, and you can do that by just going to our website and sign up for the newsletter. They'll keep you involved with the activities and stuff that we're involved in and the talks and presentations that we do for North Texans. Because we, we want people to love gardening and we want people to learn how to garden in North Texas. As Tony's was saying, it's, it's a tough place to garden. So, <laughs> with the, and so we'll continue. Whoop. I was gonna share my, I've got to hit the right button. I cannot share why other participants- Let me uh, stop sharing. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry you. about that. No worries. I appreciate all your um, uh, information and pictures. That just makes, uh, that is just great. So I'm going, we're going to hand out, we talked about the, the top 100 cards we're handing out. The, the confirmation will be sent out by dcmga.communications. So check your email, check your you know, your drunk email in case you, that you don't receive it. That's why we'll be sending that today. And here are our folks that are winning these cards. Joanne S, Dorothea T, Susie C, Louise D, Chris W, Donna S, Jelaine L, Brenda W, Cindy T, and Don, I put S-C-H <laughs> instead of just S. So congratulations, we'll send you a confirmation later. And um, you can send me, um, your mailing address and we'll mail these cards to you hands-free prizes Yay. awesome and uh, we appreciate you very much for attending today if you're interested in becoming a Denton County Master Gardener we're currently taking applications you can fill those out online at dcmga.com and like I said you can post your questions at uh, for Tony on her Facebook page if you have questions for Denton County you can contact our help desk and if you're in another county, contact your local Master Gardener Help Desk. I know we had a visitor from Lubbock. So the Permian Basin Master Gardeners out there, great group. You know, contact them with your gardening questions. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy so gardening, everybody. All right. Thank you.